really excited to be here with you today to talk about why classical music is the wave of the future. But that's kind of normal coming from me because I'm a classical musician. So I'm a conductor, I love conducting opera, and I love conducting symphonies in Europe, in the United States, in North America. But I love it so much, I also love to do mentoring and teaching, so that's why I uh, founded the Transylvanian Opera Academy with our two beautiful young artists that just performed for us. And I also did so another special project with my daughter during the pandemic lockdown. We made an, a children's edutainment show so that we could um, share the beauty of classical music with the next generation of music lovers. So classical music is really my passion. What do, what do I mean, what am I talking about when I say that it's the wave of the future? Before we talk about the future, let's talk about our present. How are we today? I think we're feeling a lot of things, and I think the feelings are not super great right now. Uh, we are feeling threatened. We are feeling threatened by a lot of different things. Uh, the political situation that we have going on today, everybody's interrelated, so even if it's not in our own country, it's right next door. Uh, we're feeling threatened by the polarization that's happening right now. We need to have more dialogue. Right now it's either black or white, we're either for or against, and that sense of rigidity is really, it's a little threatening to us on either side of the fence. We're also feeling alone and isolated. After two years of global pandemic isolation, we as humanity have never come across something like that, and we're still suffering the effects of being physically and also emotionally uh, forced to spend time apart and alone and isolated. We're also maybe feeling confused. This is the era of post-truth. This is the area of deep fakes. What can we listen to now? Who can we trust? Maybe we shouldn't trust anybody, and that's a dangerous scenario to go down. We also have the metaverse, and we have social media that can take us away from the immediacy of what it is that we're feeling and experiencing today in real life. All of these factors are potentially dangerous for humanity and for our very social fabric because it can disintegrate. So what can we do about that? And that gets to the future. What can we do to strengthen the social fabric? The solution, as I see it, is let's cultivate humanity. And we're looking at humanity here today. Let's talk about what humanity is and then how can we strengthen it. Humanity has three broad concepts incorporated into one word. It's very rich. The first is human. Now, what do we mean when we say human? Well, to err is human, right? To make mistakes is human. To be ephemeral, to be full of faults sometimes, but also to be unexpected. This is what it is to be human. And that's the first part of humanity. The second part is to be humane. Now this is the distinction because to be humane is to have the most noble qualities of being a human being. This means kindness. This means generosity. This means consideration for other living beings. And this is what humane is. And then we have the third concept, which is community. When we're talking about humanity, we're talking about a global community of each and every human being on planet Earth. Uh, so being a part of a community is really important in the definition of humanity. I have some great news for you. Classical music is the ultimate humanity builder. Now, why am I saying that and does that make any sense? Let's get into it and we'll start exploring right now. Firstly, classical music is human. Everything about classical music, and by classical music, I mean Western classical music, and I'm centering around the historic perspective, so 1700s, 1800s. Uh, everything back then was based on the human. For example, in classical music, we have some Italian terms to tell us what tempo, is it slow, is it fast, is it medium? But a lot of them have to do with states of the human being in motion. For example, andante means a walking tempo. Allegro means a quick tempo, a lively tempo. Maybe some of you have heard of a fugue. That's a piece of music where the theme fugues. It runs. It runs on top, on bottom, and is playing hide and seek with our ears. So our, uh, our Italian words for the tempo and also some of our very pieces have to do with what we are as human beings. We also have fragilities inherent in our very structures. 
we have the human breath. If you're going to sing something, you've got to take a breath at some point, right? So all of the, the classical music phrasings are finite. They're defined by our own fragility. We also have the bow. If you think of a violin bow, it's made of beautiful, noble materials, wood, horsehair, metal. And these, what, what goes up must come down, so you have to change the bow. We cannot have phrases that go on and on and on forever and ever. Even one of my mentors used to say that any pulse in classical music is like a heartbeat. So the heartbeat can fluctuate. It's not a metronome. It's not a machine. It has to live. It has to breathe. So this is what it is to be human in classical music. There's another thing that we must do also. As classical musicians, we are going to take one of the most precious thoughts or feelings of a composer that lived maybe 200, 300 years ago, put it down on a piece of paper. We're going to read that piece of paper. We're going to understand what that composer meant to the best of our abilities. We're going to synthesize it into our own body, in our minds, in our hearts, and also physically, so that we can recreate this feeling, this sensation, this message, and give it to you in real time. So this is a really important process, and we have to be able to give ourselves time and space to do that. Sometimes we just don't have it, and so what we do is we start with the breath. Now, if anybody has done meditation, maybe this sounds like something you've done before, but I'd like to do the first of a, a little series of exercises with you today. So the first is, let us breathe together. So for that, I ask you to put your feet firmly on the floor, so to not cross your legs so that the energy can flow freely. And then you have a very good posture, not like a soldier, but as if a beautiful golden thread pulls you by the head. And you feel very free and open. And we breathe in through our nose, and then we breathe out as if we're blowing out a candle through our mouth. And we breathe in. And then we breathe out. And as we do that, we can become a little more centered in our own body, and we can still some of the thoughts that we have racing around, and we can be more present in the moment. And that too is being human, also being an analog experience. When we have an analog experience, it means that we are 100% plugged in from beginning to end in a continual fashion. It's happening now, in the present, in real time, with real people, can you believe it? As opposed to digital, which is a reconstitution of little slices of sound or of experience, and then they're represented to you, and it's an approximation of what happened. So. When we're talking about classical music, we're also talking about analog experience. Now, how is classical music humane? As you can see, we also make music together. It could be two people, it could be 10 people, it could be 200 people. There's even a symphony that has 1,000 people. But no matter if it's two or 1,000, we're making music together. And what do you have to do in order to make music with somebody else? You have to connect. You have to connect and be in synchronicity with other people. Now, how do you do that? Especially in a day like today where all you want to do is protect yourself. Well, the first thing to do is relax, and we did a little exercise with this. But the second is to let go of the ego a little bit so that you can leave space for somebody else to enter. Now, this time, we're going to try a variation on the exercise. We're going to breathe in all together, but then when we breathe out, we'll make a sound. We'll actually sing a note, and the note will be this one. La. Okay, let's breathe in together. La. Okay, that's very good. We're gonna do it again. And this time, when we make that note, I want you to listen and open your ears, and also open your eyes, and listen to what's happening around you. What is your partner to your left, your partner to your life? What it, what's happening in front of you, behind you? Okay, listen to yourself, but also to the others. Here is our note. La. That's a beautiful collective hum, thank you. 
All right, now let's go on to the community because we've heard about this now. What is a community? A community is a set of disparate elements that are distinct and yet they work together in a symbiosis to create a community. Community does not mean homogeneous. It means beautifully heterogeneous. So for example, in a classical music concert, you have the musicians on stage working together, but within that orchestra, let's take the orchestra, you have the violins, you have the celli, you have the clarinets and so on. They're all different, but they're performing different functions together to make up the orchestra. Then you have the conductor, they're doing something different. Then you have the public, and the public is also contributing 100% to the music making experience. Remember, this is analog. So this is all happening in real time with real emotion and so on. Also, when you are experiencing a live event, even something like this, the physical waves of the voice and of the instruments are penetrating us on every level. Physically, these waves are coming through our bodies because we're here to feel them. The uh, ideas that are conveyed in the music are also penetrating your minds. And then the emotions that you might feel associated with the art are penetrating our hearts. So this is something that we are experiencing wherever we are, whether we're on stage, we're performing different parts of what we do on stage, and we're in the audience. And I tell you that when we're on stage and we feel the energy from the public, it, oh, it just fills us with life. So there is a real-time exchange of energy, too, going on when we have a community, like when we have a classical music concert. So the third and final step of our experiment with our impromptu chorus is, instead of all singing the same note, we're going to divide it in half. And this is great, because we have a central staircase. So we're going to have first part of the chorus here, second here, OK? Now, la. And this is going to be your note. La, or down here if you're a man, but I can't get there. <laughs> OK? Let's practice one from this side. Here we go. This is our note. And breathe. La. Very nice. My goodness, we're in tune. That's amazing. OK? And now we're going to have the new note. Here's our new note, or here is our new note. Ready? La. Excellent. All right, and our final thing, we're going to sing together. This is our note, and this is our note. Ready? Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> I love that because in the space of just a few minutes, we went from being all strangers to being a heterogeneous community of music makers from the audience. So I think that's pretty fabulous. And this leads me to my next point, which is classical music is just fun. As you can see, you don't take yourself too seriously. I was saying that this is a moment where you you do your preparation before, right? It's like packing the parachute before you jump out of the plane. You want to make sure you do a really good job. You prepare. You're very concentrated. And then the moment where you have to jump out the plane, don't be thinking about it. Have fun. Just jump and embrace that sensation and have the assurance that I've done a good job before. Now I can have fun. And that's what also classical music and music making in general is all about. It's about having fun and connecting. You can also do tra time travel. If you go to see an opera, for example, you're going to see 15th century Spain. You're going to see La Boheme on the moon, which actually happened in Paris, by the way. Uh, you can see all kinds of different things. And you can also have an escapist moment. But it's an escapist moment that is 100% human. So even the escapism is a healthy sort of escapism. And it's also catharsis. Uh, there was a beautiful story on another TED Talk about a boy who had had a very difficult um, moment in his life, and his brother had been shot and killed. And he went to his first classical music concert, and afterwards he talked to the conductor. And he said, you know, I was really happy to come to this concert because um, you know, my brother uh, unfortunately died, and I could not cry for him. 
But I cried during this concert, and I was really happy because that allowed me to cry for him. Sometimes we need a symbolist moment because we can't face the emotions directly. We need help sometimes, and art can help us to be in touch and to evacuate and to express. So these are all the bonuses about classical music. So the takeaways are this. The first is take the classical music challenge. Dust off that instrument that you have hanging around somewhere that you haven't touched in a while, or if you have a local choir that you were thinking about joining, go ahead and make the plunge, or buy a ticket and go see a concert. We can do it now. It's, it's a miracle, actually. So go ahead. You will enjoy the experience. I guarantee it. But more broadly, I would say dare to analog your life. Unplug yourself from the reality of an increasingly digitalized and isolated everyday existence and dare to have moments where you are in direct contact with other humans living and breathing together in real time with no filter. Hashtag no filter. The future is actually in the hands of us all today. Each action and each thought that we have every day contributes to our future. And if we choose to put humanity at the core of what we do, then we can all make a better future for all of humanity, one breath at a time. Thank you. <laughs>